I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. Peter Cousins, his overwhelming new telling, uh, The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West. And approaching this story in the middle of it always is the character, the chief, the towering American Indian figure of Sitting Bull. Peter, what is important now, all these decades later, about Sitting Bull? What, what makes him such a dominant figure through all the Indian War? I think the, his constancy. Sitting Bull, if you, if, if you had to characterize him in maybe three or four sentences, you could say he was absolutely dedicated to the traditional way of life. He wanted to avoid contact with the white man, if at all possible. He was not looking to, to provoke war. He was willing, of course, to fight for his people's traditional way of life, but only in a defensive sense, strategically speaking. He was not looking to provoke war with the whites. So, in essence, he would... He, his life was dedicated to, and dedicated not only to preserving his people's way of life, but he honestly believed that he himself had been chosen by Wakantanko, the great spirit, to give as much of himself as he absolutely had to, including his own life, for the well-being spiritually and physically of his people. The 7th Cavalry. Custer commanding arrives at Fort Abraham Lincoln. This is now the Northern Plains opposite the Lakota and Sitting Bull is a Hunkpapa Lakota. He is a, a Sioux of the great nation of the Sioux. He's a leader of one subgroup, but they all listen. They have councils together. Custer arrives and he begins expeditions at, against Sitting Bull and the Olala. These are the peoples of the Northern Plains where we're looking right now around the Yellowstone Park area. And this first instance, Custer gets great headlines. He has newspaper men along with him, but they're just skirmishes. What does Custer know about the Olala? He's moved from the Southern Plains where he was successful against the Kiowa and the Cheyenne. Does he know, does he understand he's up against a different enemy here, Peter? They understand is that the Oglala and the Ungpapa, the tribes of the Lakota, of course, are a different a different people than the Southern Cheyenne, uh, who he had fought in the uh, he had fought in the Southern Lakota, who he had fought earlier. But uh, he assumes that their method of making war is essentially the same, which which it is. Um, so he doesn't know them intimately by any means. I mean, these are his first encounters with them. But he believes he understands their methods of, of making war, uh, and and in fact he he does he's a, he's a bit reckless and he's a bit lucky in these two skirmishes, but um, in general he acquits himself fairly well. They're minor they're minor skirmishes in the larger scheme of things, but the nation's eyes are on them because Custer is escorting uh, railroad surveyors through the Yellowstone country. With the, with the intent of building a railroad across the northern plains. So you have a lot more attention being given these expeditions, expedition than other, otherwise might be the case. The summer of 1874, uh, Custer heads into the Black Hills, and he has in mind that there might be gold there. Who told him that? Who started the gold rumor, Peter? The, the rumors of gold in the uh, Black Hills had been swirling around as long as, as white men had been in the country. It, it, uh, even the, the uh, mountain men uh, four decades earlier had brought tales of gold in the Black Hills. Um, the problem is that any, any, any of the few miners who might have attempted or would-be miners who might have attempted to penetrate the Black Hills never came out. <laughs> so these rumors were unverified, uh, but they, they were widespread. Um, the nation at the time was in the midst of a, of a, a terrible, terrible economic depression that made 2008 really look like a hiccup by comparison. Uh, unemployment was was uh, was horrendous. Uh, the nation was was uh, nearly bankrupt, and the idea that there might be a huge store of gold in the Black Hills was obviously quite appealing. Custer's official purpose for going into the Black Hills 
assigned him by General Sheridan was to search for a spot to put another army fort to help control uh, the Lakota, keep them from raiding uh, into Nebraska, which in fact they weren't doing. But be that as it may, that was the that was the official purpose. And there were two miners who went along with Custer, who purportedly were fitted out at Custer's own expense to to look for gold and to to confirm or deny these rumors of gold. Uh, there is an attempt by Red, Bo- uh, Red Cloud at this point to make peace, knowing that there's conflict coming between the whites co- uh, pushing into the Olala territory, the Sioux territory, and Red Cloud travels to Washington, and he looks to talk to Grant. He looks to talk to the Grant administration. These are the closing months of Grant's time. This is seven, a- 1875. Uh, do does the army does the Bureau of Indian Affairs does the part uh, the, anybody in Washington realize that Red Cloud is looking to stop a war? Do, do they understand him, or do they just offer him tr- uh, trinkets? Also, the um, their this point they're beyond really caring what he has to say. The administration, the Grant administration, is intent on acquiring the Black Hills. Uh, you know, punto, end of story, peace, peaceably if po- possible, but ultimately by force if necessary. So the Grant administration is, is out to acquire the Black Hills. They've decided what they're willing to offer. And at that point, it really doesn't matter what Red Cloud wants or, or, or is willing to... to All right, that's offer. the spring of 1875. Now there's a secret meeting in the, in the fall-winter of 17, 1875. In fact, my note here, Peter says, the important meeting took place uh, some December 3rd, 1875. Privy to this meeting were Sheridan, Crook, Belknap was there. Sherman knew about it or was not attending, but he knew it was happening. Sheridan was there. What was the purpose of the meeting? Why did they set it up? Se- uh, Secretary of the Interior Zachariah Chandler was there. Well, this, this meeting, it, um, if, if, I, if I can give a, a larger plug, it uh, actually occurred on November 3rd, 1875. And to me, in a nutshell, it was, it was a secret cabal, for lack of a better word, gotten up by Grant to provoke a war with the Lakota who were not on the reservation, that is to say, crazy horses and sitting bulls people. These were Lakota who were, they were out, they were on land known as the unceded territory, which by treaty, the Lakota were permitted to hunt on. And it was not clear from the treaty if they were permitted to live there year round, but no one had really challenged that. Uh, it was, the purpose was to provoke a war with them to, to, and then defeat Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and these, you know, so-called non-treaty or roaming chiefs, their defeat would then intimidate reservation chiefs like Red Cloud into signing over the Black Hills for whatever terms the government was willing to offer. Grant uh, called this secret meeting to to uh, to uh, set in motion a war. I, I uh, essentially called it in the book, and I firmly believe it was it was the most egregious. Um, uh, Act on the part of the government uh, in, into provoking a, a conflict of of the, of the magnitude that followed, really, in the, certainly in the history of, of government relations with the tribes of the American West. And uh, as a side plug, um, if, I might, if I may, Smithsonian Magazine in their next issue will have an article by me on this entire meeting and uh, and what happened in its aftermath, where I'm able to expand on it in much greater detail and uh, just what a striking uh, betrayal it was uh, of the Lakota by the Grant administration, which had entered office, honestly granted enter office, you know, as you know, eight years earlier with a pledge of making peace with the Indians and uh, was reduced to uh, by by this point to provoking uh, a, a, an unjust war against the uh, Lakota. Very, a very tragic, tragic turn of events. We turn to the last months before the tragedy that begins the tragedy of the Lakota. The book is The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian wars for the American West. Peter Cousins is the author. When we come back, 
Custer and the campaign of the summer of 76. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Bachelor, this is the John Bachelor Show. Peter Cousins, his book is The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West. We are at the moment where General Terry, General Crook, Colonel Custer, all of them are now following a course laid out by the Grant administration. Provoke war with the Sioux, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse and all of the attendant tribes, the Cheyenne, everything is going to collapse right now into what we know as the Battle of the Big Ho- Little Bighorn. And then after that, the retribution, the blame shifting, and 140 years of what happened and why. Peter, General Terry's in charge of the overall. General Cook's along. He has a 1,000 men. They also have a battle plan laid out to provoke, to find the tribes and bring them to battle? Is that why they're out there? And the, this is the Yellowstone River all the way up to the Bighorn. Are they seeking a, a, a set battle piece? Is that it, Peter? Well, there are three different exposition, expeditions moving simultaneously. There's the one under General Terry, uh, which Custer is principal subordinate as commander of the 7th Cavalry, that are moving uh, from east to west, along uh, roughly along the line of the Yellowstone, there's an expedition under Colonel John Gibbon that is moving east from Montana Territory along the Yellowstone, and then an expedition under General George Crook that's moving north from uh, north central Wyoming. And the idea it's a it's a pretty rough plan, and as as by necessity it had to be because. No one quite sure where the knew where the Indians were at any given moment, and the Indian village moved every three or four days. Um, the idea being that at least one of these expeditions would make contact with the with the Indians, and the notion was that any of the three were large enough uh, to tackle the Indians on their own, given the army's intelligence on Indian strength, which happened to be happened to grossly underestimate the Indian strength. Or that if, you know, by some quirk of fate, some, you know, stroke of luck, uh, two or even all three of them were able to converge and, uh, and, uh, and crush the, the Indians uh, between the three. So that was kind of the rough plan, that uh, one would strike them uh, and uh, with, with luck perhaps both or all three. There's a smaller battle, Battle of the Rosebud, and there are not many casualties. There often aren't. The Indians break off. But General Crook, at this point, you write, loses stomach for the fight. Was was he appalled by what they were doing? Is that it? No, I think Crook, Crook um, the Rosebud is, in terms of the number of troops and the number of Indian warriors engaged, was actually the largest ba- battle to occur in the Indian Wars of the, of the West. The uh, Crook between soldiers and his uh, Shoshone and Crow Indian auxiliaries and, and civilians and teamsters. He had uh, at least 1,500 uh, uh, men. Uh, I can't recall the precise number, but at least 1,500, uh, if not closer to 1,700, 1,800 men. And the number of uh, Indian warriors, of course, is, is never certain, but it was at least 1,000. So this was, it was a, and it was uh, fought over this rolling, you know, open uh, prairie uh, back and forth through ravines and up ridges and just, you know, this, this swirling affair almost all day long. But the casualties were low because, as you, as you say, in part, the, the Indians did, did not close with the enemy. They were not looking to sustain or inflict heavy casualties, but rather to, to teach the soldiers a lesson that is to leave them alone right. and to, to, to uh, they hoped, force them to withdraw. And neither side could could uh, hit the broad side of a barn, really. So it, it, it's really remarkable uh, having walked that ground, and to think that this this action involving almost 4,000 men went on the better part of a day, and the casualties total casualties were less than 100. But it was a major blow in that it it knocked Crook out of the 
out of the campaign. And Crook, not so much, he was not defeated militarily, but he was defeated psychologically. He, Crook, uh, had had great success against the Apaches, but he had never, he never encountered more than a, you know, relative handful of Indians at a time and basically guerrilla warfare. He never, in his long career, had never faced a set piece battle with hundreds of Indians galloping down on him through ravines and over over ridges. I just think he, I think frankly think he had the heck scared out of him. June, and just uh, was psychologically defeated. June twenty second, Custer heads up the Rosebud. Uh, we'll follow Custer for just a moment here, just right at this moment. Sitting Bull has a dream or a vision. What is it, Peter? What does he see in his in his uh, vi- in his spirits? He has a vision during uh, the Sundance, which was the the most important ritual, religious ritual of the, of the Plains Indians, particularly the Lakota. And in this Sundance, he he undergoes um, self-inflicted uh, torture to help provoke a vision, you know, a dream. And he sees. Um, innumerable numbers of soldiers falling from the sky upside down and a far smaller number of Indians falling upside down from the sky. He interprets this to mean that Wakantanka, the great spirit, is telling him that the that the, his Lakota Cheyenne Alliance will score a great victory against the army with small losses. And he further interprets it to mean that they will score this victory, but they will only, only reap the fruits of this victory if they do not mutilate or plunder the enemy dead. And that is, that is his vision. And that vision, is it conveyed to the other tribes, everybody gathering? Absolutely. So- Absolutely. He can, it's conveyed to everyone attendant uh, at the Sundance and that included the, not only the Lakota, but also the Cheyenne allies. So word of that vision, it, it spread like wildfire throughout the, uh, throughout the tribes. So and it, elect, it electrified, electrified the, the, um, the warriors and the chiefs. And it was one of the reasons why they, I think they fought with uh, the, the abandon they did at the Rosebud, because they had such confidence that they were, that Sitting Bull had, had a divine vision that they were going to achieve a, um, a great victory. However, the Rosebud was not that victory, as Sitting Bull was quick to remind it, because in his vision, I should add, that the soldiers were falling upside down into the Indian camp. They were falling into an Indian village. And, of course, at the Rosebud, there was no Indian village near. They were, and so Sitting Bull's vision was not fulfilled by the Battle of the Rose, but it was yet to be fulfilled. There will be a smaller Indian village at the Little Bighorn when we come back. The Battle of the Little Bighorn, seen by Sitting Bull before it happened. Peter Cousins is the book, The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West. I'm John Batchelor. I'm John Batchelor. Peter Cousins, The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West. We come to the moment that is burned into the 20th and 21st century memory of the Indian Wars. That's Custer's Last Stand, so-called by Hollywood. Peter, 31 officers, 578 enlisted men, 45 scouts, a total of 660 all told. As Custer rides off in late June, this is June 22nd, June 23rd, June 24th. What were his orders in his mind at this point? What was he to do when and if he found the Sioux? His orders uh, from General Alfred Terry, his immediate commander, were to find 
the uh, Sioux Village, find the, the large village of Sitting Bull, combined village of Sitting Bull and, and uh, Crazy Horse in the Cheyenne, and essentially to use his discretion once he found the village, which, of course, as Terry well knew when you're talking about Custer, that meant most likely that he would attack it. And that was, uh, that was fine by Terry. So essentially it was to, to find the village and then uh, use your discretion as to whether or not to attack. There would be another column, a smaller column, coming down the uh, line of the, the Bighorn and Little Bighorn River uh, from the, the north and west, but there was no expectation on Terry's part that Custer's column and this other column could really coordinate their movements or uh, in, in any way, shape, or form engage the the Indian village at the same time. This is that was no, known to be an impossibility given the the nature of Indians to move every day or two and, and uh, the other vagaries of, of the situation. So Custer's orders were discretionary. So um, and, and in Custer, the and then, then use your judgment. In Custer's mind, this was going to be Washita, the the attack that he'd made many years before that had been a great success. He was going to find the village and then advance, and that was a great success for him. Then it will be now. Let's come to the, the June twenty fourth. He rides 25, 28 miles that day. They're, they're exhausted, That there are signs of Indians somewhere, somewhere around them. Their scouts are bringing in information. Now it's the 25th. Indians are on the trail. Custer believes that he's lost the element of surprise. How does he react, Peter? He reacts uh, with the decision. Uh, once he learns, and it's ironic that the the information and his scouts had been telling him as crow scouts throughout the course of the day that he should attack at once that they've been spotted and he's not entirely convinced he he really wants to rest his men he wants to rest them for the re- for the rest of june 25th and then attack fresh on june 26th and he's not entirely convinced of his indian scouts reports that hey that we've been seen until his brother rides up and says, you know what, one of the pack mules on the back trail dropped some uh, rations, and we went back to look for it and found some Indians scrounging through the rations and had to drive them off. And Custer assumed that these Indians would then ride around his command and alert the village. And that is what, when, he, when his brother told him that, he instantly decided we've got to attack now because we will most definitely have lost the element of surprise. And the Indian village will do what Indian villages always had done in the past, which was to pick up and scatter as quickly as possible. Ironically, those Indians that were scrounging through the rations on the back trail had no desire to get, get ahead of Custer or get involved in any kind of fighting whatsoever. And they, in fact, trailed along behind and waited until after the battle to join the village. But... <laughs> Sadly, Custer, of course, could not know that, and he made an instant decision to to attack when he learned that. From Custer his divides his command. Benteen and, and one other commander stays with the pack train. He sends Reno to the left. Peter provides maps of this. He's going over the battleground very carefully. Reno, because he has in mind that he's going to attack La Washita, come from different directions around the village, though he doesn't know how big the Indian encampment is. And he will be surprised to learn that it's vast. He's going ahead with 221 men riding straight into the Indian village. Reno makes contact first. Reno's conduct is puzzling. You've been there, Peter. Did Reno take advantage of the landscape? Did he respond uh, responsibly to get news to Custer? Uh, I think Reno, at first... It, it's very hard to say. Reno had uh, a fairly small command. He had uh, 170 some men, in, uh, of which about 40 were Indian scouts, whose job was not to participate in an attack, but to gather up what they could of the Indian pony herd. So he had you know, fewer than 150 men, and he's he's riding into the valley, and it's, it's spectacular to see this broad valley today that he was charging over. Uh, and he, instead of coming upon a smaller village that is about to run, he comes face to face with the tail end of a village that's as vaster than anything he could possibly have imagined or anyone had ever seen. 
And there's a critical moment. He has to decide whether to ride headfirst into the village and try to disrupt the Indians who are not expecting him or to to pause and take up a defensive position. And he makes the decision to stop, form his men on an open skirmish line, on open ground, and uh, start firing into the village. And that is... Um, the first of a fateful series of decisions. He does that. The Indians have time to gather themselves. They begin to ride around his flank. He pulls his men back into a stand of timber next to the little bighorn, and he's not sure what to do. And then Custer had given him his favorite scout, um, who was talking to Reno, and suddenly a bullet, the scout's name is Bloody Knife, suddenly a bullet blows apart Bloody Knife's head and uh, spatters his brains all over Reno's jacket. At that point, Reno completely right, loses right. it. Reno, He's been drinking. Reno, right. Uh, they f- they very, fall back in disorder. We could say that. They, exactly. He, right. He'd been drinking. He was, he, was, he was in shock, and he essentially said every man for themselves. Right. And uh, he rode off toward the nearest high ground across the river, which actually turned out to be a decent enough position, but it was not something that he'd planned. Right. That becomes Reno's Ridge. Now, Custer, at around 3 p.m., uh, spots the vast encampment of the Sioux and the Cheyenne. It's vast. It's, ne- it's bigger than anything he's had. He sends word to Benteen to come quick. He sends him a note at 3 p- 3.30 p.m. He writes, I'm following your reporting. That's the last we know of Custer. That's it. And Peter's put together a very good and uh, a convincing case for what Custer does after he sends for Benteen to come up. He does not know that Reno's not uh, uh, falling back. He's by himself on the high ground overlooking what we call the Little Bighorn and the Indians called the Greasy Grass River. He intends to attack by himself, Peter. Is that what we think he was going to do, to get down through the coolies to attack the village? Exactly. Um, to... Uh draw some of the pressure off Reno, perhaps, so that Reno could press his attack, because the last time he saw Reno, Reno was was um, uh, in good shape. He was, you know, had not fallen back into the timber. So you speculate that he uh, wanted to take the village and what in, in the flank, by the, in the side, so to speak, and, and uh, take the pressure off Reno so that two of them could... could um, create a sort of pincher movement on the village. That seems to have been most likely his first line of reasoning. Um, that didn't work. He, he, the command he rode down to the river with was immediately thrown and hurled back onto uh, high ground on, the, on the, his side of the river, the east side of the river. And uh, then he made an attempt uh, to... Uh, ride further down and uh, outflank the entire village and perhaps take enough women and children, presumably who were fleeing the village, prisoners, so as to somehow it cause the warriors who were f- to draw off and not engage him. He believed at this point that he was outnumbered. However, he continued. He set up what you call the, on Battle Ridge. He sets up a defensive position. He stops his offensive position and digs in. Up to this point, had he ever seen the, uh, the Sioux keep coming? Had, or they'd broken off at some point when they set up a defensive position? I'm trying to imagine how much trouble he believed he was in. Well, he, he, uh, he had a little inkling uh, three years early on the, earlier on the Yellowstone when he engage, when he was engaged by with uh, a much smaller force, he had a couple companies. I think we discussed this uh, earlier in our conversation, and he was attacked by perhaps 200 Lakota warriors, and they kept coming off and on all afternoon. So, I mean, he had an inkling that, gee, perhaps Lakota might be more persistent than I than I would believe, um, but. Um, their persistence this afternoon on June 25th, 1876, was was unprecedented. Of course, they were guarding their women and children. Right, exactly. Uh, and they were, were right they believed them. that Custer was going to slaughter them if they didn't exactly. fight back, I mean, exactly. because that's they what were, had happened no, at Washington. No op- right. They had no other option but to, 
but to press on. And uh, he'd caught he'd uh, the cavalry come up. Their women, the children, the whole encampment is spread out. They're not in a defensive position. The crazy horse attacks Reno. Then he breaks off and he attacks Custer. Sitting Bull gets involved. So all of the Sioux are now attacking Custer. And sometime between five and five thirty, it ends with the massacre of the whole command. Benteen finally joins Reno, and they don't know where Custer is. In fact, it will be days before they're free to roam around and look at the battlefield. You have the reporting that General Terry arrives on June 27th, when they're still counting casualties because Reno's been taking target, sh- I mean, pot shotting for the last two days. When Terry realizes the extent, this is General Terry, who'd been on the Yellowstone River, the extent of the massacre. What were his thoughts? Had he ever experienced anything like this? Was this a total shock to him? No no one uh, in the United States Army on the frontier had experienced anything approaching this. Uh, This was was, uh, unprecedented. And before I uh, discuss Terry's reaction, for those who haven't been to the Little Bighorn, it's very instructive to realize that the hill that Benteen and Reno were on is nearly five miles away from the hill Custer died on, and with intervening hills and ravines. So they, if nearly five miles, and that when I first visited the battlefield, that literally blew my mind to realize how far apart they were. So they, they had no inkling, and uh, Benteen disbelieved Terry when Terry told him what he'd found, that is to say Custer and all the dead. Terry's reaction was, his first reaction was, Oh, you know, oh my, you know, oh my God, this is this is horrible. And then over the course of the next day or two, as he was steaming down the Yellowstone River, knowing he had to write a report of what had happened, he began. He essentially prevaricated, and he started thinking of his own hide. And he he changed the narrative, and no longer uh, had he given Custer orders to act on his own discretion. But now Terry is reporting that he had told Custer to find the Indians and then wait and not engage them until the other column under Colonel Gibbon came up. So he prevaricated, he changed the narrative, uh, and that became, it became, began what essentially was a, a, a blame game, a shifting of, of the blame onto Custer for everything that happened. The book is The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West. Peter Cousins is the author. When we come back, The Pursuit of Sitting Bull and the Sioux warriors who have fled back into their own lands from the U.S. Army. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Batchelor, Peter Cousins, his book is The Earth is Weeping, and we're very careful now, after Custer, to talk about the reaction of the Congress, the President of the United States, certainly of the Army. Uh, Terry has now shaped the story so that as much blame as possible goes on Custer, but the Sheridan commanding everything now goes to Congress and says, you must give me more men, you must give me two forts on the Yellowstone, you must give me military control of the Indians. Congress says, yes, here's everything. They push money into his lap. He now has enough to deploy everyone to chase Sitting Bull. Nelson Miles enters. This is a man who is relentless through these next years of the Indian Wars. He leads the 5th Infantry. So this is no longer cavalry. This is a pack train following men walking across the the landscape. Crook grows after Crazy Horse, and uh, um, Nelson Miles presents himself as somebody pursuing Sitting Bull. Peter, you've seen the landscape, an infantry force. Is it as effective as a cavalry force uh, pursuing the Sioux? It um, depends on a number of number of uh, things, but in general, and surprisingly, the my answer would be the same as the argument Nelson Miles used before Congress when he was arguing the very point that infantry was more effective than cavalry in chasing Indians. His point was that, which is 
quite true, I think, that arm, the army horses, unlike the Indian war ponies, who could live on the, the, the grass such as it is out on the Great Plains, the army horses, they, they needed forage. They needed, they needed their hay and oats and, and large quantities of it, or they, they'd start to break down. And there was no way anyone could have a supply train large enough to keep the horses in good shape for, for very long. And uh, whereas Miles' point was, and I think he was correct, is that uh, uh, unless you were facing the most extreme weather conditions, that the soldiers, as long as they had rations, uh, and they didn't require nearly the, what the horses did in terms of quantity of rations, they actually got stronger as, as, as the campaigns progressed, through, as the marching progressed. They, got, they toughened up and they became stronger, and they were actually a more effective force against the Indians over a longer longer period of time, and uh, uh, Miles proved that to be the case. Over the course of the summer, the Sioux break up, the great alliance that came together just for that moment in June, is now going in many different directions. Some of the Indians, like Red Cloud, they side on with the military. They come in. They saw, they give their signatures. Others remain renegades, chiefly Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, going in different directions. All of the tribes of the Sioux, remember, they're different sub-tribes. They're different tribes here, have different leaderships. Miles, however, is relentless in pursuit of Sitting Bull uh, into the winter of 76-77. The Indians call them walk-a-heaps. Walk Why, Peter? Because, essentially, they walked... They seemingly never tired. They were constantly nipping at the Indians' heels uh, all winter long and would not give them, uh, give them any rest. The Indians could not stop and camp in any uh, location for any, any length of time. And um, that, that's how the name came about. And they call uh, Miles Bear Coat because that's what he wears. He wears a coat made out of a bear. He finally catches up with Sitting Bull and Gaul and the, uh, the, per, the Indians running away from Little Rock in, I mean, from, uh, from uh, Little Bighorn in October 20th. And at this point, many of the Indians surrender after a skirmish. Sitting Bull, however, will not, and neither will Gaul. They will go to the North River. We then follow Crook, who has Mackenzie to pursue the Cheyenne. And we mentioned Colonel Mackenzie before. He is Crook's best weapon. And in pursuit of the Cheyenne, is he relentless to the Cheyenne fear him, Peter? He, uh, he, Crook decided to attack the Cheyenne because he felt he'd lost the element of surprise uh, against Crazy Horse, so he turned against the Cheyenne and uh, sent Mackenzie after the Cheyenne. The village of Cheyenne that uh, he attacked did include pe participants in the Little Bighorn. It also included a lot of agency Cheyenne who had just come out to join that encampment and uh, who had no desire to fight the whites. In fact, most of the Cheyenne, even the ones who had been in the Little Bighorn, were about to come into the agencies and give up of their own accord. They didn't want to fight any longer. Uh, Mackenzie launches a, a dawn attack against the Cheyenne village, and he has nearly as many, nearly as many Indian auxiliaries fighting with him. Back to that our concept of Indians fighting Indians. Uh, Shoshone and Pawnee auxiliaries, as he has soldiers, and he overwhelms the Cheyenne, absolutely overwhelms them. In, uh, in, a, in a, a dawn attack, they are f they're, the Cheyenne are smashed by Mackenzie. Uh, Absolutely, and, and Dull, uh, Dull Knife's people are finished. They break. Uh, they they will have a strange and sad fate, as will all of these Indians. So what we have here at the end of seventy six, going into seventy seven, is Sitting Bull has gotten free and has a choice whether he goes to Canada or not, what they call Grandmother's Land. Crazy Horse will not come in, and he's running free, but he is not going to Canada. Nelson Miles of the infantry and Crook of the cavalry are in pursuit, serving under Sheridan, and they're all under Sherman, and they're all under Grant here at the end of 76. The elections just happened. There will be a new president in 77. At this point, however, the Indian Wars are fully engaged, and it's important to make the point here in Peter's book that it was Little Bighorn that made all this happen. It was the tragedy, the reversal, the shock of the defeat of Custer that gave Congress and the president and the army the authority to pursue the Indian to what? 
To what end? Where are they going with this? We'll find out when we come back. The book is The Earth is Weeping, the epic story of the Indian Wars for the American West. Peter Cousins is the author. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.